Good afternoon, everyone, and what a lovely day it is. Uh, welcome to day four of Holding Space, a national conversation series with libraries. We have had some really extraordinary conversational conversations along this tour route, and today is stop promises to be equally engaging. So today, I am just thrilled and pleased to join you from the John Brown Watson Memorial Library at the University of Arkansas at Pine Bluff for a conversation about how HBCU, historically black colleges and university libraries develop leaders and strengthen communities. We are delighted to present today's event with our co-hosts, the Arkansas Library Association and the Black Caucus of the American Library Association Thank you and welcome everyone. So uh, a lovely day it is. I know many of you uh, probably are just joining us after watching uh, the, the funeral services of Representative John Lewis. Uh, may he rest in power always. Uh, you will be hearing more uh, from me about John Lewis in the latest American Libraries article. But today I wanna talk about leaders and we are so honored to be joined by an esteemed group of leaders, activists, and legends in librarianship. Uh, everyone around this table has had a unique role and journey, and I can't wait to hear from them. So I'm gonna begin by introducing one of the finest young library leaders that I know, that's right, uh, Mr. Bradley Kirkendall, who is the reference and instruction librarian at Lincoln University in Missouri. Uh, and Bradley is also a member of my Presidential Advisory Committee, uh, a very active and engaged member, that is. And he is going to co-facilitate this event. So Bradley, welcome. And will you please introduce our esteemed panelists today? I will. Thank you for that lovely introduction. Here gathered with us today, we have Edward Fonnet, the Library Director at John Brown Watson Memorial Library. We also have with us Dr. Jesse Carney Smith, the retired Dean of Library at Fisk University. Um, next, we have Shantae Burns Simpson, the current PCLA president. And we also have Andrew Zaku Jackson, the executive director emeritus, Queens Library, Langston Hughes Community Library and Cultural Center, and trustee of Queens Public Library. And last but not least, we have Kathy Anderson, director of DW Reynolds Library and Technology Center at Flanders Smith College. Right. Thanks, Bradley. And welcome, everyone, again. So now, uh, before uh, we get started, I have to note that um, one of the panelists just reached a milestone. Dr. Jesse Carney Smith has recently claimed the title of Emeritus. Mm -hmm. Dr. Smith, I want to congratulate you on your retirement. Uh, I'm not sure that it really is a retirement, but we're going to call it a retirement, I, I think. Um, and thank you on behalf of the American Library Association for your continuous membership throughout the entirety of your extraordinary professional career. So thank you so much, Dr. Jesse Carney Smith. Thank you, too. All right, we're going to get started. Um, uh, let's see, Bradley. So, okay, so um, one of the things I want I wanted to say to you all that when I started planning this tour, uh, one of the major challenges that I had was uh, how was I going to join the Black Caucus of the American Library Association uh, for the 50th anniversary. Uh, that was to be held in Tulsa, Oklahoma. I can't be in two places at one time. I was going to be on this bus, going across country. They're going to be in Tulsa. You know, how was I going to figure this out? And so, um, you know, I, I thought the, 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 the thought of missing this momentous celebration would have been disappointing. Um, so, you know, sometimes there's a rainbow in the cloud, and I know we're in the middle of a cloud, but uh, we now look forward to the celebration of the 50th anniversary of the Black Caucus of the American Library Association next year. Sure. And, but for now, it's important to mark this milestone for an organization that has profoundly impacted me and our panelists today, so, and so many other librarians around the country. So I wanna start, start off with getting uh, Shantae in here. And Shantae, I wanna ask you, 
Um, what should we know about the plans for the 51st anniversary celebration of the Black Caucus of the American Library Association? Well, thank you, Julius. On behalf of the executive board and the members of BCALA, we want to just say how proud we are of you, President Jefferson. Uh, we have a lot planned for our 50th, so be on the lookout for a bunch of different celebrations from our affiliates across the country to celebrate the 50th anniversary. But we also have a lot of things planned for next year in Tulsa, Oklahoma. So NCAL has been postponed to July 28th through August 1st of 2021. Again, it will be in Tulsa, Oklahoma with the theme, Culture Keepers, the Sankofa Experience, inspired by our past, igniting our future. We have so much planned. Uh, we have tours of Black Wall Street. Um, we have numerous workshops and networking opportunities, of course. And we have folks like Mary Wilson, Tommy Davidson, and Jason Reynolds, just to name a few. I don't want to give it all away, but this conference will be for everyone. So we hope to see all of you there. Uh, thank you, Shante. I can tell you I'm going to be there. And I want to bring Sekou in here because uh, many of us know, and those of you, those of you who don't know, Seiko was also a past president of the Black Caucus of the American Library Association. And Seiko, I know you were involved in BCLA when it celebrated uh, 20, the 25th anniversary. So I want you to share with us what you think the younger members of the library community should know about BCLA. Uh, well, good afternoon, everybody. And uh, thank you for letting me be a part of this panel with my colleagues and Sister Elder. Um, always good to be in her presence. Um, I've been a member of BCLA since uh, 1992 at the first uh, National Conference of African American Librarians, and that was the impetus to for me to become active. Um, prior to that, I, in fact, even at that point, I was a not I was not a librarian. I was working in the library. I was a director at the Langston Hughes Community Library and Culture Center of the Queens Library, but I had not become a librarian yet. Uh, so I was always welcomed into the family because I was an activist and I was active in doing some things uh, with libraries in New York City. Um, but I was always an outsider in the profession. Um, but once I saw all of those librarians, all of those black librarians, males and females from all over the country, from the Caribbean, from the continent, I had to be part of that. Um, and I felt that uh, if nothing else was the spawning ground for the activism that I have had since then and brought into it and since then, it was the role models that I saw in Dr. Tyson, Dr. J Josie, uh, Stanton Biddle, all of those black librarians and, and sisters and brothers working together across the country who were making a difference in the profession, who were representing our needs uh, as library professionals, but also the needs of our communities, uh, but with also the struggles that we still had uh, that parallel the civil rights movement within the profession of librarianship. And the Black Caucus was necessary. And that's why Dr. Josie and all of the elders who founded the Black Caucus created this organization to challenge the American Library Association, to challenge our colleagues in the profession, and to challenge those people who were still uh, reticent about providing services for, to, and of our people within our communities. This organization was one on the, on the uh, spearheading that struggle for justice, equality, and equal opportunity within the library profession. And that was the reason the Black Caucus was created, but it also is the reason why the Black Caucus is still necessary because there's still work to be done. All right, all right, thank you. Thank you, Sekou. Uh, I think now, Bradley, you're gonna take over. Thank you, Julius. So um, I first want to say um, it's an honor and privilege to be here. Um, BCLA was uh, very instrumental, as well as my experiences at Lincoln University and HBCU in Jefferson City, Missouri, not in Pennsylvania. Um, but I would like to hear your thoughts about how uh, HBCUs shape leaders and what your personal experience was, Julius, uh, attending HBCU yourself. Oh, okay. You're going to turn it around on me. Thank you very much, Bradley. I appreciate that. I'll be brief because I want to hear from everyone else, but I'll just say my perspective. Um, 
will be as a student. I was a student at Howard University. I'm an alumnus of Howard University. And so when I think about uh, HBCU libraries, I, uh, the only image that comes in my mind, and no disrespect to the, the, uh, the library directors here, is Founders Library, which is the, the center and heartbeat of the campus of Howard University. And when I think about libraries in that respect, I think about uh, space and people. So I think about Founders as a space, as a historic landmark built by Albert Cassell, a, a black architect. I think about um, the people. I think about those individuals who uh, were in the library during my time at Howard. Uh, I'll just mention a couple. Ethelbert Miller, who was, uh, had been a student and worked at uh, Founders Library and African American Resource Center um, that was a, a champion of all the students. I think about um, Sterling, the great Sterling Brown, who had an office on the third floor of Founders Library. And these are individuals um, that uh, certainly influenced me and, and many of the students had access to, not to mention um, the great librarians who supported me as a student and as staff member at Howard University. So a shout out to all the uh, librarians that work in historically black colleges and universities. Thank you uh, for supporting the students. But um, I think we should hear from some other folks as well, Bradley. Yeah, so uh, Mr. Fontenet, could you elaborate on how HBCU libraries develop leaders within their communities and not just their students? Thank you so very much. And thank you, Judith, and the American Library Association for having thrust UATV, the University of Arkansas at Palm Bluff, and our library into the mainstream of uh, librarianship for the, uh, the, uh, for the world. Um, at the University of Arkansas at Pine Bluff, we have an office of leadership through which we channel most of our leadership programs like voter education and um, uh, census activities and this kind of thing through that office. However, in the library, we have a program called uh, Student Success. It's our leadership program. And uh, we, it all started out uh, through our information literacy program that we uh, exercise for the various disciplines on campus. Um, each dean has a leadership program and um, we work very closely with each one of those deans. Teacher education is uh, one that, call, call, that call, immediately calls to mind because I talked to Dean yesterday to make certain that all of the elements that we've been working with in the past were still there. And she said, by all means, they're still there. What we do with that program is uh, either the advisors to uh, the various disciplines or the students themselves or the deans or whomever refer students to us for help. And uh, we help with uh, basically tutorials, preparing those students for those exams, that they have to take priority admission to the programs like teach education. Um, one that concerned us a lot was uh, the uh, exam that you have to take to get into teach education. So we have worked with those students. We've even hired uh, clinicians and uh, consultants to come in and work with us uh, and the faculty and those students to make certain that we get those good students into teach education so they get do the practice exams, et cetera. But there's a, list, a checklist that uh, the educators have come up with uh, for successful teaching and teachers. And the dean so told me that each one of the students, she makes certain that they abide by the checklist. And so we work with these students about uh, the behavior that they're supposed to exercise when they go into teaching. Uh, and um, it works very well. The, t uh, the dean said every student has uh, a checklist. And she said every student that walks across that stage who is an educator is licensed and uh, is hired. She said she does not train students uh, to be teachers who are not hired and not licensed. We also work with the nursing department who uh, have a similar kind of uh, criteria or they have similar, criteria, similar kinds of criteria 
to become nurses. Um, we only have a 20 student uh, quota that goes into that program. So we have to be very, very careful. She had the, the, the dean has to be very, very careful who she lets into the program. Most of our, our program is a bachelor's degree program. Most of our students who come to us have not, they have no notion what a bachelor's degree nurse is all about. They witness uh, RNs throughout their lives. So when they come into the program, um, they're checked off just like the people in teacher education about the, uh, their, how they are supposed to conduct themselves as nurses. We work with those uh, young people to be certain that they meet the criteria and they get through the, uh, the program. Um, we have worked with the city also in developing, I was on the board for what we call a leadership pine bluff group that we help to train local young people to be leaders in the community. And um, I think uh, that constitutes what I'd like to say about the leadership program, uh, except that the Dean of uh, Agriculture, we applied for a grant with her. Uh, we went through our uh, uh, information literacy program. She noted that we had a component of our program that dealt with assessing students' performances while they're in, in, engaged in their academic. And she became highly, highly interested in that program. So we are going to, that might be more than we can chew, but we're gonna bite that bite, bite off on that, maybe in uh, our grant or our next year's program. I think that might constitute, you know, basically what our, our program, specifically in the library, is all about. Thank you. Uh, thank you for your um, comments on how your institution uh, helps out in regards to developing leaders. So I would like to ask uh, Dr. Smith, with her illustrious uh, career at Fisk University, on how her library um, helped develop leaders, not just with students, but also within the community. Okay, um, let me begin by saying something that you have heard a lot recently about the boy from Troy. Well, there's also the boy from Fisk. The Lewis is one of our graduates and quite a leader. And we were so proud, you know, to be connected with him throughout his, uh, all of his work. Um, this has a part of this motto, we train leaders one by one. I don't know how you do it one by one because some of the drugs off on other people, but what we try to do is what Lewis said. We try to get in the way. So whatever Fisk is doing, we're out there and we're involved in it. We've done a lot of good things through uh, public programs that have been funded by grants where we invite students in, we invite uh, the community in, we invite the, there are three other HBCUs here, we invite them in and um, teach them things that the grant is promoting, such as uh, preserving photographs or um, maybe whatever it's about, that's what we get involved in and we get that way we get students from the community and from high schools who want them to become librarians or want to come to school or want to do something on the campus. We work with students at, in, at, the, at the beginning of their uh, tenure at this, and we find those who are interested in libraries and some of them want to be librarians. And when we find that out, we work with them, we hire them, we, we teach them um, the activities of the various departments get them out in the community to do things. And that has been very rewarding. We work through churches and uh, community groups, um, your own professional organization or your social organization. And some of them like fraternities and sororities have programs to train leaders. And we try to work with them to, um, to train people in the community. There's one thing I do at my church, I have to throw this out. Um, during Black History Month, a lot of churches, you know, a lot of groups celebrate Black people for one month. And I said to our pastor, well, we're Black all the year, so we can do something all the year to celebrate ourselves. And so I do a piece monthly dealing with Black history. It could be back about Black leaders or whatever. And that has brought a lot of interest into 
a fish or some of the projects that are going on elsewhere in the community. Um, I say too, it's not a bad idea to train followers. Not everybody's gonna wanna be a leader. Not everybody should be a leader, but you have to know how to work with people to follow them, to get ideas from them, and perhaps that's a spinoff from that to something that really fits your calling. Um, I have to give it all up now, but it doesn't mean that I can't persuade people to get involved in the community. And now, of course, what we all going to be doing is people getting people involved more in leadership when it comes to voting, registering young people to vote, uh, taking people to the polls if you can, and that sort of thing. So um, we're not as fortunate as they had fought the net down there, but but with a little, little we have, you know, we've gotten great benefits from it. I like to attribute a lot of our success, however, to those funded institutes that I mentioned. That's brought in a lot of success. Thank you very much. I, I really think it's very important now more than ever that we uh, focus on voting. And um, once again, I really appreciate the long history that you have uh, provided at BCLA and at Fisk University. Um, but we're right on the lawn. Kathy, I would love to hear um, what you have to say, what you do at your institution in regards to developing leaders. Well, thank you. From uh, First of all, I'd like to say thank you very much for having me, and I am truly honored to be on this panel. And because I've just started at Philander Smith last year, I've just completed my first year. And so uh, what I like to focus on is uh, mentorship and uh, being available and creating and collecting and disseminating information throughout the campus and the community for the students. And so uh, I would like, I like to be a mentor to students just to show them and help build them and be that instrument that helps restore their self-dignity, self-esteem, self-respect, and uh, their self-confidence. And so they, they are able to go out into the community and model that for other citizens. And so what helped me in my leadership in becoming where I'm at today is my mentors, my librarian mentors and my non-librarian educators that uh, I grew up with. Um, I had several mentors in my uh, career before my career in my elementary, my first librarian, Ms. Carol Robinson, um, librarians uh, throughout my um, tenure as becoming a librarian, uh, the late Sandra Dupree Campbell, to Ms. Teresa Jeshua, Ms. Georgette Wiley, Mr. Fontenet, um, all of those librarians were instrumental in to, for me to become who I am now and where I'm at. And so I think if I model that to other students and encourage them that they can go on to become leaders in their own communities as well. Nice, very nice, very nice. And thank, thank you, Bradley. And I, I'm gonna turn it back on you, Bradley, now, since you turned it on me, I'm gonna turn it back on you. Um, because I wanna talk a little bit about, um, in addition to everything we just heard, um, another, another idea of leadership development, and that's the leadership development program uh, that's near and dear to me and uh, to everyone at the American Library Association. That's the Spectrum Scholars Program, um, which you are uh, or were a Spectrum Scholar. So can you talk a little bit about how your participation in uh, a, a Spectrum Scholar cohort fits in with the rest of what we just heard? Uh, yes, thank you for bringing that up. So I was a 2015 Spectrum Scholar, um, and it was very instrumental in regards to uh, helping me out at my institution. Um, the Spectrum Scholarship uh, actually paid for half of my tuition at the University of Illinois, and it also provided me a little stipend, so that helped me out in that regards. But um, one of the coolest things that I liked about the Spectrum Scholar is that it acclimated me into the ALA profession as well as BCLA. So one of the cool things about the Spectrum Scholar uh, program is you can join as many of different affiliates, uh, roundtables that you want to. And of course, I joined uh, BCLA, um, and I was introduced to you and several other different people on this panel who have been instrumental in helping me um, progress through my academic career and also progress through the librarianship. So. Um, 
I think that's one of the best things that ever happened. But another thing that has been really, really, really cool is the amount of different people that have experienced some of the same things that I have. Um, being at a PWI is very challenging in regards to adapting to different cultures and not having a lot of people with me. So having a cohort that was experiencing the same things was very beneficial to me to bounce off people's ideas, things of that nature. Even today, um, one cohort uh, member that I um, personally keep in contact with is Tawana Hodge. Um, she's currently the diversity librarian at the University of Florida in Gainesville. And um, she, if she's feeling down, or I can talk to her and get her back up and the same thing. And we also bounce different brand ideas and, you know, different teaching methods um, off of each other. So uh, I think the Spectrum Scholarship Program was a great thing that LA did. Uh, we have a lot of great people that's come through the program and I happen to be one of them and I look forward to uh, continue the tradition of helping other black librarians and other minorities uh, in developing and becoming better librarians. Thanks, Bradley. And I think that's a good point because we have to think about um, what we've just heard from Mr. Finette, uh, from Dr. Smith, from Kathy. It's always about giving back. Um, I know that's a theme that you'll hear uh, Sekou talk about. Um, giving back is a part of being an activist librarian, and I know that um, we all aspire to be activist librarians, I hope. So I want to pivot just a little bit and talk a little bit about um, HBCU libraries and scholarship. And of course, the first and foremost uh, libraries are about learning and advancing scholarship. So what are the challenges you face, particularly in this current moment, and for those of you who have been doing this for a while, uh, there are a couple who have been doing this for quite some time. Um, what, is most, what is the most impactful change you've seen in recent years? Um, let's start with you, Dr. Smith. So we wanna really talk about just the idea of scholarship and some of the challenges and some of the most impactful changes you've seen recently. Okay. Um... I must say that under my administration, I have really focused a lot on advancing scholarship. Um, I do it with my staff. I not learn to say I did it, but I just retired fairly recently, so I had to change the tense, verb tense fast. But um, I start with my staff, and I encourage them to go to uh, professional meetings. I encourage them to um, present at professional meetings. I encourage them to write and to publish and with my staff as well as with our faculty whenever I'm writing or editing certain kinds of books and can use assistance of other people, I always call on them. And almost always they come through. I try to give them assignments related to their particular interests. This, has, this pays off because it helps me with my publication. It also helps them when they need to apply for tenure, a promotion, or need a recommend, letter of recommendation for whatever purpose, even to take another position. Uh, I've been very happy about that, enjoy doing that. I, uh, you know, I like to see our librarians, whether it's this or anywhere, get more involved in promoting scholarship. Um, I've seen in recent years, I've, I've seen a greater interest in our library, in our archives in our library. People um, you know, would like to come to special collections, that's a place where students used to like to come and sit and read because it was quiet. You get scholars coming in from other places and that is very uh, important because some of that rubs off on the students or faculty to be able to uh, be in contact with someone from the University of London or Japan or uh, Chicago or wherever. Um, I've used students on, on some of my special projects, I'm not quite ready to write the publication uh, not the lower level students, but I do have them involved in some of the research that goes on and they get, they're thrilled about that and go on from that. Sometimes a topic that they have been interested in from the beginning of their years at this is something they're going and develop later on in graduate school. So when I find out there is something, well, I encourage them to think about something you may want to pursue for quite some time. And uh, that has paid off. Um, I think you had asked us earlier, we, we were supposed to talk about some of the projects we've done for which we were especially interested. 
Sure. The yes. one thing that, that uh, we've done was to create a database for the Rosenwald schools. And that is those 500 and some thousand schools founded in the 15 southern border states to train blacks in most of the rural areas in the South. Started out with a, really inspired by Booker T. Washington and funded by Jesus Rosenwald and funded by states and so on. And I attended a Rosenwald school, didn't know it at the time, didn't care less because Rosenwald won. Then the late on, I learned who he was. I was very happy to have been in one. And to know that North Carolina, which is my home state, had more Rosenwald schools than anybody else really spurred us to do something about all these photographs that we have. So by doing this, creating this database, that has saved our special collection staff a lot of work from having to look up a photograph of the, the school and find out information about it, when it was built, how much it cost, and um, a photo, whatever that they may need about it. And a lot of them now are using those Rosenwald schools as community projects. Uh, could be like a community center or um, some kind of cultural center. So it's been very rewarding to get those out there. Uh, to have them available for you. Um, we're challenged most by being under under financed. Mm. Yeah. It's, it's, it's you know, part of our life. But that doesn't mean you can't do things because you don't have the money you want to do it. Find a way to do it. Do something else. Maybe maybe you can't do what you thought you wanted to do, but there's something else that you can do. And we are fortunate because of our special collections, because there's always something that can be done there. And so um, by, by having that collection, those collections there, and being able to share it with the community, to share it with other institutions, to bring in our faculty and students, it's been most rewarding for us. So um, One, but we'd like to uh, also work with students who may have a special project that they're interested in. For example, a few years ago, our students declared that they wanted to do a research project on the Fish Coast, well, that is coast on every campus, so I hear. Mm -hmm. But that mm -hmm. included interviewing people, it included going through archives, it included going to the site where the ghosts have supposed to have been seen, and all of those things. And so, um, through that project, they concluded was no ghosts, and they kind of broke some hearts because people wanted to believe that there was a physical ghost. So uh, it's one of those the things that we enjoy doing. I don't know. Maybe the ghost of Du Bois, uh, W. B. Du Bois, walking around campus. <laughs> late, late. I mentioned some of those students do their work. Um, I want to want to turn to Kathy. Um, they met to us all day and the other day. Maybe that was the voice and the man walked out across. <laughs> uh, I want to turn to Kathy and ask you the same question, uh, Kathy. So uh, what are the challenge, challenges you face um, during this particular moment in terms of scholarship? Well, uh, like Dr. Smith said, uh, limited budget. Uh, but we like to focus on uh, one thing that I instituted when I came to Philander is the PSC faculty collection and the PSC alumni collection. We have numerous alumni and faculty that have uh, written books, articles, things of that nature. And so we showcase them at the front of the library. And so we have a special place that we put them. So when the students come in, we can show them that what have alumni have done, what faculty, what their teachers have done, their current teachers, former teachers have mm -hmm to encourage them and let them know that this is possible, you know, to write books, articles, and things of that nature, and encourage them to learn more about that and to uh, advance their scholarship. So um, staffing uh, is a challenge as well. Um, we wear many hats when you're a small college, and so sometimes it's uh, a little bit difficult, but you just persevere and you keep going. And so uh, we just try to show them that it's worth it. It's worth it at the end. All right, thank you. Uh, we're gonna turn to Mr. Fontenet. Um, same question, challenges, and certainly um, for your, your long tenure, um, you know, 
most impactful changes you've seen in recent years? Yes, uh, thank you. Uh, as Dr. Smith indicated, we at UAPB, and I'm sure at all, the HBCU uh, universities have to meet the same criteria that the existing faculty and other faculty members uh, have to meet for promotion and tenure. Our, our board regulations specify that librarians have to meet that same criteria. Um, we try to encourage our librarians to have second master's degree. I think most of our librarians here have second master's degree. And we form liaisons with the various disciplines uh, that we correlate with our master's degree program. Um, we have one, uh, at least one, uh, of our librarian who is in a PhD program. And even our paraprofessionals, we have two paraprofessionals that are currently in a master's degree program in library science. Um, if our faculty members, our librarians are called upon, we, we like to do our teaching in our uh, information literacy program. But we have one or two faculty member uh, librarians who teach in the discipline programs like um, nutrition and this kind of thing. Um, we have full time jobs and uh, finding time to engage in scholarship is, is, is very, very uh, uh, crucial. So we do the best we can in terms of allocating our time for um, a, a, a scholarship and all this kind of stuff. Um, fortunately, I, I, I don't know how I did it, but I've earned full professorship. And I hope that uh, my librarians to come will be so rewarded. Um, it's challenging to work as a librarian and to uh, maintain uh, scholarship on HBCU campus. All right, thank you. And um, I want to turn to Shante, but before I do, I just want to say one thing about uh, Dr. Connie Smith. I can remember as a student um, reading your work on notable black uh, women. Um, and those were the days when we had the big reference books and we would pull them out and use them. I know Bradley's looked like, well, I don't even know what that is. He has a big reference book. Um, <laughs> And now everything is digitized, but you know, thank you for your work because it was it was so helpful in uh, getting us through writing papers and assignments. And so um, I know it's, it's a challenge, uh, but I, I'm glad everyone is committed uh, to keeping the standards very high in terms of scholarship at HBCU, starting with those who are our uh, directors of the libraries. But I want to turn to Shante here because Shante, you're at the New York Public Library. Uh, which, had, which has, alongside HBCUs, one of the premier centers for black scholarship uh, in the Schomburg Center. So um, tell us a little bit about uh, the Schomburg Center. Sure, so the Schomburg Center for Research in Black Culture is one of the New York Public Library's three world leading research libraries. Uh, for 95 years, the Schomburg Center has preserved, protected, and fostered a greater understanding of the Black experience through its collections, uh, exhibitions, programs, and scholarships. Um, I'm going to highlight two. I work for um, the Youth Education Services within New York Public Library, so I'm going to focus on the ones uh, around education. Um, we have the Schomburg Center Scholars in Residence Program, which offered long-term and short-term fellowships to support scholars and writers working on projects that would benefit them from the center's, you know, extensive resources. And then we also have Schomburg's Junior Scholars Program, which I want my son to definitely take. It uh, allows 100 youth, 11 to 18, to participate in a free Saturday program that's during the school year to increase their historical literacy, expand their knowledge of who they are as intellectuals, social, cultural, and artistic beings, and encourages them to embrace their legacy as African American citizens and learning about their trailblazing ancestors. 
So those are the two that hands down I wanted to highlight. Thank you, thank you. We're gonna turn to Bradley. So um, HBCUs uh, play a unique and important role in preserving history, um, even so more now than ever. Um, that is not always visible in white institutions. Can you talk about preservation efforts at your institutions and or initiatives that you're planning or are proud of? Um, could we start with you, Dr. Smith, on some of those things that you may have worked on in the past? Okay, um, when I first went to this, um, there was a great need to process archives. And so we were fortunate to do so through grants mainly started from the Ford Foundation. Um, and that just spurred us to continue to do that through grants. And most of the time, those grants involved um, preserving pamphlets or books, not, you know, that was what I call real way before automation. So you couldn't think about anything digital at that time. But just to get those, those particular items processed, having spent so much time in and un air-conditioned space, you can imagine what they were like. So that was our first involvement. But more recently, the thing that has really been rewarding to us has been our preservation project that came through the HBCU Library Alliance. Starting first with the old Solomon and now, uh, now mainly through the, uh, the Alliance, with money from Mellon, regrets from the Mellon Foundation, with support from the University of Delaware, to preserve photographs in your collection. And it, it, it's been quite a task. We uh, have thousands, maybe 15 or 20,000 photographs, which is a lot for a small institution. And every time we turn around, we find another photograph because they get stuck in every collection. And you're challenged to find out, well, where should I put these? But just to be able to locate them has just been wonderful. And uh, some of them, you know, go way back to uh, our beginning. Uh, some of them, you know, uh, relate to our sports team. Sometimes we do displays on this football when we had a team and basketball or whatever. Um, we had, unfortunately, we had very little on the civil rights movement. I don't know why, but it was before my time there, but very little on the civil rights movement. But to preserve those photographs has been remarkable a more remarkable thing for us and for people who want to use them. And like you, I'm sure you get a lot of requests for images from the different collections. It's also a little money-making project for us because we do charge for use of, of the items from our photograph collection. We also preserve um, the Lincoln Bible. You go on our website, you'll see it. It's a beautiful Bible, full fit size Bible given to us by Robert Todd Lincoln, son of, um, the president, of President Lincoln, given to President Lincoln by loyal, then the real colored, colored people of Baltimore. And we get, I have a lot of interest in that Bible, but it was in such bad shape that we had to do something to keep it together. Um, we have, um, our students also use these photographs now in, in their term papers or whatever they may be interested in. So without the assistance of the Alliance, I'm not sure where we would be when it comes to preservation. Uh, we're also are concerned about getting the materials, the books and other items stored in the proper atmospheric conditions, lighting conditions or whatever. And that is still a challenge for us. I think it will be for a while, especially now. Thank you for those remarks. Um, I know here at Lincoln, given everything that we have going on, um, our scholarly community, uh, scholarly commons library is actually doing a timeline for when the COVID started, the Black Lives Matter movement started, and it's going to be something beautiful. I hope everybody um, has an opportunity to do some preservation for themselves. But uh, moving right on along, Mr. Fodnick, could you talk about your library and some of the preservation um, efforts your institution is developing or you're very proud of. Yes, uh, we're very, very proud of having restored the John H. Johnson's homestead. Um, you know, John H. Johnson was very crucial to publishing, especially black 
all writers. He's the founder of Ebony Magazine. So we took it upon ourselves to visit. Uh, Jesse, we visited Anna Bonton's house in Alexandria, my stomping ground. and got lost in that area. So we model our project on the Anna Bonton house. And together, uh, we've been able to restore John H. Johnson's house. And um, his daughter has recently come to visit the house. And um, it's in a little city that's fairly well isolated, uh, Arkansas City. But uh, we hope that it'll be a tourist city, ultimately. Well, it's the early city in Arkansas. And Miss um, Linda Rice Johnson is instituting a, a girls camp at that site. So we hope that um, more people in Arkansas will learn to appreciate the work that John H. Johnson has done. We have several um, little projects that we're, we hope we can implement. Uh, we've recently been approached by um, um, the uh, Disney uh, cartoonist who won an Oscar, who is a, one of our alumni, and he wants to donate his artwork to the library. So we're going to see what we can do about uh, you know, securing that. And a very prominent author, I mean, uh, attorney, um, uh, John Walker, someone has approached us about depositing his speeches um, in the library. We're very positive about acquiring those. Um, we're very difficult for us to compete with uh, uh, moneyed institutions in terms of acquiring our notable uh, uh, alumni works. But um, we plan to persevere and to do whatever we possibly can to acquire and preserve those. Uh, those. We, we have a lot of new equipment for preservation in the library that we've got through our time three grant. So we think we'll be, we'll, we'll be more competitive in the future in terms of acquiring and preserving um, the records of um, our, our alumni. Those are some very um, interesting uh, preservation collections that you're going to be trying to endeavor into. I look forward to looking at that once you get a hold of them. Um, so, Kathy, could you uh, explain what you guys got going on at your institution? Okay, uh, we have the PSC Digital Archives, and uh, that way you could show we show through our digital collection, uh, what we have in our archives. And so that is a, a huge uh, collection uh, that we love to, for you to look at. And we also have the largest museum quality of African-American art in the academic library in Arkansas. And it's uh, displayed on our first and second floors of our library. And we're very proud of that. And we're also proud of the donation of African-American art that we received from the Katz family uh, that is located in our uh, archives. And we're very proud of that uh, as well. Awesome. Seiko, the institution that you just retired from has a similar mission. Can you talk about the Langston Hughes Community Library and Culture Center a little bit? Sure. Um, this, this library, the Langston Hughes Community Library and Culture Center of the Queens Library in New York City um, has a very unique history. It was the, the brainchild of the residents of the community during the uh, civil rights period. And they realized that one of the things that was missing in Queens County, one of the five boroughs of New York City, was that there were no libraries in the borough that um, had collections or programs and services that service the needs of the African-American community. Because, <clears throat> excuse me, because this was during that civil rights period, um, they looked at the needs for future generations and that Langston Hughes Library would be the Black Heritage Library for the borough of Queens and not just the local community of Caroni Stelmers and that it would house the Black Heritage circulating collection uh, for Queens County. And this was so that it didn't compete with the mission of the Schomburg Center for Research in Black Culture in Harlem. The collections that the, that the Schomburg Center 
are all uh, reference research collections. They're not circulating materials, but we wanted our collections to be accessible to the community. Uh, the other thing that was unique was that instead of just being part of Queens Library, the body of, of the community that formed itself was called the Library Action Committee, and they were a representative composite of the Black community, from people on welfare to people that doctors, lawyers, ministers, business owners, teachers, educators, and they all came together to form this organization, a nonprofit organization called the Library Action Committee of Corona East Elmhurst. And when they presented the idea of opening this library in the Black community, serving the needs of the Black community of the borough, they decided they wanted to run the library under the jurisdiction of the Queens Library. Um, of course, that was a, not necessarily something that was a normal. The library systems usually run the libraries, but because they had such uh, insight and they had such powerful uh, development of, of leadership, uh, the Queens Library looked at it. Uh, they realized that the library system was not meeting the needs of the black community, and they forwarded it up to Albany for uh, Albany to approve it through the state education department and the state board of regents. Little did they know that there was a gentleman who worked for the New York state library system who was an activist library himself and his name was E.J. Josie. And Dr. Josie looked at the, looked at the proposal that was submitted. He saw the need for it. He saw this in parallel, the changes that were taking place within the profession of community activism and community input. And he said, well, we should fund this because it's going to be funded every year through the Library Services and Construction Act in, all, in Washington through the Education Department. Every year they'll have to reapply, they'll have to show what they've done, what they've accomplished, and if they meet the needs of the proposal. And the, the grant that we got was a Library Service and Construction Act Title I grant um, that was there to open the library, but the library was so successful. It opened up. In 1969, um, we had that Black Heritage Reference Collection of Queens County. We, we created information services. We created a cultural arts program, and we created an after-school tutorial program. So all of these co components of the public library branch were completely new because most libraries just dealt with circulation of books. We were about serving the entire community, and our premise was that you were here to serve the unused, the, the non-library non readers and non-library users. And the way to do that was not only through books focusing on black history so that the people in the community could see books with themselves about themselves, but the books about themselves and the books that we had written, but also the arts and culture. Um, so we had a complete cultural arts program. And every year we applied, it was supposed to be what they call the seed money grant that would get you started, uh, and then it would be fall under the jurisdiction of the library system to keep it going. But because this was a full-fledged library and cultural arts center, it got funded every year. And not, not only was it funded for the three to five years that the, we were eligible, we were so successful at our goals and our mission that it was funded for 18 years, and the Library Action Committee board actually ran the library. They were responsible for running the library. They were responsible for the budget. They were responsible for hiring and firing staff. They were responsible for the day-to-day -day operations of the library under the jurisdiction of the Queens Library. So it turned out, as you look back on it now, we just celebrated 50 years of operations, that it is a role model for what libraries could be. And the original staff under the direction of a young man named Tyrone Bryant, who also himself was not a librarian, those five people that coordinated and developed the foundation of the library that I ran for 36 years actually were pirated by the Broward County Library System in Florida, and they opened up five branches modeled after Langston Hughes. Today, one of those branches is, is named after Tyrone Bryant. So the concept of community involvement was part and parcel of what made our library unique and was a role model for libraries that are around the country. That was, that was beautiful, Sekou. Um, we are coming to the, the, the bottom uh, or the actually top of the hour. And so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ask you one more question to kind of wrap it all up. Um, so um, yesterday, the bus was just right a mile away from where uh, Fisk University is. Um, we were at Nashville Public Library. And we had a great conversation 
about confronting difficult contemporary issues through the lens of history. So what does the library community need to know and how do we help shape the path forward towards justice? Um, we'll, we'll go ahead and, and get it, let everybody get a, get a chance to, to get in on this before we begin to close. So we'll start with you, Dr. Carney Smith. Okay. Um, I always want to say I don't know because things are so different now. It's so challenging. We are facing the most challenging part of our history. And I heard the news this morning that um, our institutions, all institutions, are rethinking the way they're going to run the schools. Mm -hmm. It calls on us to rethink the way we're going to run our libraries. And you don't know what you're facing. As uh, I don't want to sound preachy, but as Raphael Warnock said it, uh, Lewis is still, we even change the way we hug now, the way we run the funeral. So I don't know. But I do know that this has a history of being involved in activism. Uh, even before the civil rights movement, this is out there involved in civil rights activity. Our uh, Race Relations Institute started way before the civil rights movement, started back in the 30s with our first black president. So we think activism in the community, activism on the campuses, but the challenge has been and is to find ways to ex to um, support what's going on as best we can. I think about uh, something that I you probably know about. I heard uh, after George Floyd's uh, murder that bookstores, a bookstore in California, had a run on black books, particularly in, on those dealing with racial relations. I don't know whether they run about white people or black people, but a run on books dealing with civil rights. So maybe that'll happen to us, I don't know. But that, that's all these challenges out there. We can no longer bring people in to look at the important things in our special collections because you can't get close to them. And so we're missing out on the beauty of actually looking at the, at, at the item itself, going back to the way things used to be before that technology. We looked at what was available in a book or got a picture in a magazine, but it, it, it's quite a challenge. It's quite a challenge, all I can say. And we have time for one more comment on that one. Anybody want to jump in here? I'll jump in. Can I jump in? OK. Yeah. So the country is dealing with the pandemic, and I can't even keep up with the statistics. The last time I looked, um, uh, African Americans were five times higher than our non-Hispanic white counterparts, but that could have changed because, again, numbers are going up. At this time, we're still standing against uh, systemic racism, but uh, libraries are uh, are equipped and prepared to do this important work, especially librarians us of color. Um, we are helping to shape the many aspects of our communities by supporting, you know, the census, promoting how to exercise our right to vote. We have to focus on um, collaboration and fundraising efforts that will influence decisions within political, economic, and social institutions. So the status quo is no good anymore. Uh, words need to be followed by action. We have to hold folks accountable. We can't afford not to. Like John Lewis said, get in some good trouble. It's necessary trouble. We need it at this time. All right, we're gonna to have to leave it right there. We're out of town, but out of town. But listen, um, this has been a great discussion. We could we could do this for hours. So I'm gonna publicly ask uh, BCLA president Shante Burns Simpson if, in fact, uh, next summer, July 28th, uh, 2021, if you would allow me to continue this conversation at the uh, BCLA uh, 50, it'd be 51st anniversary. Would, would you allow me to do that? Like I could tell you no. <laughs> of course, of course. Because you got to of saying that. <laughs> is, um, you know, we only had an hour and there's so much that I wanted to get in and I know there's so much that you all wanted to say, um, but we have to get back on the bus. And, um, and I, I just want to, again, uh, thank you all. ALA's next virtual tour is going to have meals included at the event so we can keep this conversation going, right? So when we get to Tulsa, we're going to have like a, we're going to- Appreciate you, Julius. Meals. This is a very innovative project. You got to have a great time, Julius. 
Thank you. Looking forward to it. Our panelists, uh, Edward Fontenet, uh, Dr. Jesse Carney Smith, Shante Burns Simpson, Kathy Anderson, uh, Andrew Sekou Jackson, uh, and special thanks to my co facilitator and my fraternity brother, Bradley Kirkendall. We thank you absolutely. Thank you. I see you, Mr. Fontenet. Mr. Fontenet, uh, thank you for welcoming us to John Brown Watson Memorial Library. This is my second time there, uh, here virtually. Um, you treated me so well when I was there before. Uh, and, and so well now, so thank you. Um, when it's safe to travel, I look forward to another visit to Pine Bluff to check out some of those special collections. Especially that $13 million public library that we're building downtown. It's already built. We're just waiting for uh, a day where we could commemorate it, uh, dedicate it. All right, I, I'm there. And okay. I, wanna, I wanna see Mr. Johnson's home as well. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, thank you, dear. Yes, sir. Okay. Once again, I want to thank our co-hosts, the Arkansas Library Association and the Black Caucus of the American Library Association, as well as their fabulous members who have joined us today. Congratulations, BCLA, on 50th and on your 50th anniversary. Uh, I want to give an extra shout out to ALA members who joined us today. Perhaps some of us will be able to celebrate over 50 years uh, as ALA members in the future. Uh, join me tomorrow at 2 p.m. Central and we pull into Lubbock, Texas to begin a series of conversations about school libraries in Texas. Visit the tour website for more information. Also, uh, watch for my notes from the road. They will be coming out shortly and follow the entire tour at hashtag ALA Holding Space. Uh, don't forget to join us as we advocate for the funding support that will keep libraries of all types strong so they can continue to serve their communities. Make your voice heard today. Uh, I want to tell you to stay safe, be well. Uh, thank you for holding space with us today. And I wish you love, peace, and soul. Oh. <laughs> Take care, everybody. Bye, Sister Elder. Bye. Bye. Bye, thank you. Thank you. Jesse. Okay. Great job, everyone. Great job. Thank you. Hey. Thank you. Bye. We can do this again. <laughs>